right, we're going to go ahead and start today's worship service. If you know the words, please feel free to join along with us. If not, please allow this time to be uh, a time of uh, centering yourself in worship and preparing for the message. Good morning, people of infinite worth. 
those who are here in person and those who are joining us online. I have a bunch of announcements, and for those who don't have a bulletin in hand, I'm referring to our folks who are watching uh, from their screens. Um, my apologies, but we have a lot going on, and I've got to talk about it. Uh, if you look at the front side of the bulletin, our Christmas dinner is coming up December the 5th. There are uh, forms on the back table there uh, where you can tell us how many are going to be there. Uh, and, and if you desire to help out in some way, perhaps donate uh, a dessert or something, uh, there's, there's room for that as well. Uh, and if you look in the narthex over to that side of the tree, there's a red and white box there. That's the box in which we are placing the toy donations for the Student Council of Roxana Junior and Senior High. They're preparing to do their, their 25th annual Community Christmas for Kids. And we're kind of under the gun here because we just got the box out there for this Sunday. So uh, we, if, if it's on your heart to donate toys to help make a, a Christmas brighter for some kids, uh, please do it soon because that box is going to have to be uh, taken to the school and then gone through and, and gifts wrapped and so forth. One more thing, cap and mitten tree. It's right out there in the narthex. Can't miss it. Every year it gets heavily laden with mittens and hats and just all kinds of great things that, uh, that uh, our local kids need to help keep them warm when the weather gets cold. So we thank you for your uh, donations to that as well. Um, yeah, a few more things. Today is the last Sunday of Ordinary Time, also known as Christ the King Sunday, all right? Uh, which means next Sunday begins Advent, all right? So we're going to need to be finding people who will be willing to read and light candles and so forth. And then, of course, this week we're celebrating Thanksgiving, so that makes this Thanksgiving Sunday. So just a lot, a lot going on here. And I'm glad that you all are here to join us for this time of worship and song. Before we begin the service, I'd like to ask Patterson to uh, share an opening prayer with us, please. Can we please bow our heads for a word of prayer? Heavenly Father, we, we come to you today and we're, we're constantly reminding us of, of the goodness of you, uh, and the, the, the many joys and the many privileges and the, just the wonderful blessings and miracles that you give us, Lord. I pray in this worship service today that you open our hearts and our minds to you so that we can have a better understanding of, of all that you do for us, Lord, and all that you still have planned for us, Lord. We ask all of this in your wonderful name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Oh, 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 oh. 
We don't have to dress up. We don't have to even be at our very best. Some people like to think of the uh, uh, house of worship as an emergency room for people who are struggling and for people who are broken. And uh, I think I agree with that analogy. We are going to turn to scripture today. This is the last in the series of Prayer Changes Everything. Obviously, next week we're going to start talking about Advent. So this is the final installment uh, in uh, that sermon series. We're looking into the book of Acts, and as I've asked you to do in the last, oh, several weeks, is uh, I've been asking you to read aloud with me, but this is a lot of scripture, so I'm not going to ask you to read aloud, but I do want you to open uh, your Bibles, whether you have it on a device or whether you're going to use a pew Bible, uh, and read with me uh, silently. Uh, we're looking at Acts 16, we're starting at verse 16, and if, uh, if you're using one of our pew Bibles here, you will find this on or about page 1188 in a pew Bible. I'll give you a moment to find that. As always, I encourage you to follow along. All right, and, and you'll see why this is a lot of scripture, and, and it, it reads like a novel. It really, I mean, you can just picture what's going on here. Once, when we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a slave girl who had a spirit by which she predicted the future. She earned a great deal of money for her owners by her fortune telling. This girl followed Paul and the rest of us, shouting, these men are servants of the Most High God who are telling you the way to be saved. She kept this up for many days. Finally, Paul became so troubled that he turned around and said to the Spirit, In the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to come out of her. At that moment, the Spirit left her. When the owners of the slave girl realized that their hope of making money was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to face the authorities. They brought them before the magistrates and said, These men are Jews, and they are throwing our city into an uproar by advocating customs unlawful for us Romans to accept or to practice. The crowd joined in the attack against Paul and Silas, and all the magistrates ordered them to be stripped and beaten, and after they had been severely flogged, they were thrown into prison, and the jailer was commanded to guard them carefully. Upon receiving such orders, he put them in an inner cell and fastened their feet in the stocks. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying, and they were singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly, there was such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaking. At once, all the prison doors flew open and everybody's chains came loose. The jailer woke up, and when he saw the prison doors open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself because he thought the prisoners had escaped. But Paul shouted, Don't harm yourself. We're all here. The jailer called for lights, rushed in, and felt trembling before Paul and Silas. He then brought them out and asked, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? They replied, Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and all of the others in his house. At that hour of the night, the jailer took them and washed their wounds, and immediately he and all of his family were baptized. The jailer brought them to his house, and set a meal before them, and the whole family was filled with joy because they had come to believe in God. It's God's word for each and every one of us. Before I begin the message, I'd like to take a moment of prayer. Would you kindly be in prayer with me? Dearest Jesus, we come before you today, your people. Lord, I, I, again, once again, I, I have this privilege and this opportunity of bringing the word to your Lord people. Lord, I, I pray now that the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart are pleasing in your sight. For you alone are my rock and my redeemer. We're going to begin this with just a little bit of a recap, kind of an instant replay, if you will. Paul and Silas were on their way to a place
place of prayer. And on that way, they met a young woman who had the power of divination. She could tell the future, and she could discern spirits. Now, we know that this young woman was a slave whose owners, they were getting rich on her abilities to tell the future. She saw Paul and Silas in the street. And evidently, she really did have a spirit of divination because she was able to discern something about these, the, the spirits in Paul and Silas. Because her words are these, and she's shouting out in the middle of the street, these men are servants of the Most High who are telling you the way to be saved. All right, so she knew who they were by the spirits inside of her. And she began shouting relentlessly. Scripture tells us that the shouting went on for days. I imagine every time they left the house and were headed for wherever, that she was behind them shouting and shouting, and they became annoyed. <laughs> they became really annoyed. And, and knowing that telling the future was not a gift from God, but rather it was an evil practice, they cast out that spirit of divination and suddenly she could no longer tell the future. When they cast the spirit out from the girl, she was suddenly unable to earn her owners any money, and they became so angry that they had Paul and Silas, hello, Paul and Silas arrested for disturbing the city and urging the Roman citizens into lawlessness, which were trumped up charges, right? I mean, the, 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 I don't think there was a law on the books whereby somebody could not cast out an evil spirit, but that, that's the only thing they did, but because there were no laws on the books for that, the girl's owners decided to trump up some charges, and so, so they trumped up charges that could not be ignored. So the two followers of Jesus were seized. They were thrown into prison where they were severely beaten with rods. Imagine this, to put yourself in their position for just a moment here. Imagine being beaten and tossed into prison while you are clearly in the will of God. They were that. They were all of that. They were on their way to a prayer meeting. They rescued a slave girl from an evil spirit. And, and yet they were thrown into prison. How do you think Paul and Silas were feeling about this crazy plot twist? this turn of events. Well, let me ask you a different question. How would you feel if you knew you were living in the will of God and yet found yourself falsely accused of a crime and then thrown into jail? Most of us would be angry, frustrated, right? What on earth is going on here? When, although we might not say it out loud, certainly we'd be thinking in our heads, hey God, I'm on your side, remember me? I'm out doing what you told me to do, and somehow I ended up in jail. I've been falsely accused, we've been beaten. I feel defeated. I don't understand what's going on. What did I do to deserve this? Why me, God? Ever ask, why me, God? Yeah, yeah I think we've all done that. I haven't done that. So that's how we might have dealt with that situation. How do you think Paul and Silas dealt with this surprising situation? They did a very strange thing. I mean, there they were. Prisons of that day were horrific places. They, they were just, just coated in filth. They were dark. They were dank. They were moldy. It was, it was just a horrible, horrible place to be. And here their feet were in stocks. I imagine their arms were chained to a slimy wall. They sat in this foul-smelling prison under the watchful eye of two guards that were specifically there to keep an eye on them, and those guards were brutal. So what did they do that was so strange? Well, they sang songs of praise. They rejoiced. They prayed. That seems like an odd reaction to us, except that Paul and Silas, they understood something about God. They understood that God always has the last word. Their faith in the goodness of God was so strong that they were willing to undergo any situation, any situation that they would have to do in order to stay in the will of God. Can you imagine the reaction of the fellow prisoners 
they're sitting there in their nasty, nasty cells, and suddenly they hear people singing and praying of it. They hadn't heard that in prison before. And even if, even if the singing and the praying didn't leave much an impression on them, I'll bet you the earthquake did. I'll bet you that, I mean, it just, it shook the very foundation of the prison building. And you know what happens if a foundation shifts? Suddenly doors don't close properly, or they, they just open, and there's maybe cracks in the wall and so forth. And I imagine that's what happened here. That some of the walls crumbled, the doors sprung open, chains fell off of the prisoners, and suddenly, well, they could have run if they had wanted to at that point. So when the jailer saw that the prison doors had all been sprung open wide, he was terrified. He had special orders to watch these two, these Paul and Silas, special guards just for them. And now he presumed that everybody was gone since the doors had flown open and, and the walls were crumbled, right? So he prepared to kill himself. He prepared to take his own life because he knew his life was forfeit if those prisoners got away. But as he prepared to take his own life, Paul calls out to him, assuring him that they haven't left, we're all here, he says. And when the jailer saw that Paul and Silas were still there, he knew, he knew that they were emissaries of God. Not only was the jailer saved, but his entire household was saved as well. That would be his wife, children, all the servants, they were all saved that night. Now, Paul and Silas had a divine appointment. Funny thing about divine appointments, you'll never find them written in your day planner. You'll never find them on your, your Google calendar. They're never marked, you don't know when they're coming, right? Divine appointments, and that's when God steps in and, and, and changes your course. Some people call this an interruption, right? Some people call it an interruption. Some people call it a plot twist, right? But a divine appointment happens when God whisks us off of our expected path and puts us into a unique situation and places us with people that he wants us to influence. Now, Paul and Silas didn't know why they were being dragged off to jail. They knew those were trumped up charges. They didn't understand why they had to be beaten with rods, but their faith was so strong that they knew God was up to something. This was such a far out occurrence for them. They knew God was up to something. Even if it was painful, even if it was embarrassing to them, they understood something about the way God works. Despite the stinging wounds on their backs and their forced confinement, they prayed, and they prayed with joy. Now we all have those times of trial. I don't even have to take a poll here. I know that you all would say, yeah, yeah, I've been through some rough stuff, right? We all know about that. And when the situation looks really bleak and we're certain that God has made a mistake by putting us into this situation, perhaps we can remember that even if it doesn't feel like God is in it with us, he's not with us in the middle of our troubles, but he will be waiting at the end. He will be waiting at the end. God always has the last say, he's never late, he's never early, God always wins. Our best response to trials is prayer. I don't know why this surprises me, but I, I plan a sermon series at least two months in advance, maybe, maybe more than that. It, it's, it always surprises me how the sermon series that was mentioned months ago, thought about months ago, planned months ago, somehow fits into my life at the time that I actually preach it. I couldn't have imagined that this would come together for me, but let, let me tell you, many of you know that, that uh, my sister Judy passed away uh, on a Wednesday of a week ago, uh, a week from Wednesday, last Wednesday. Anyway, she, she passed away. It was very sudden, and many of you have sent me cards, and I, I felt your prayers and, and your kind wishes and so forth, and I thank you for that. I really deeply touched my heart, your concern and your love, and I, I thank you for that. So when I, when I heard of her illness, and that she passed shortly after that, I, was, I had already made plans to fly to Phoenix, that's where she 
and her daughter uh, lived. And so, so I flew out there. And can I tell you, that was an interruption. My, I did not have that on my day planner, that, that I was going to hop on a plane and, and go to my sister's funeral, mm -hmm. of all things. Um, but that's, that's what happened. Uh, her illness was sudden and unexpected, so I went to in Glendale, Arizona, to be with her kids and their families. And all the way there, I felt like I had a divine appointment. Again, this was not on my day planner, but, but I was going there for a reason, and, and I wasn't sure what the reason was at first, so I, I prayed a lot. I had a divine appointment, and my assignment, as I discovered, was just to show the love and grace of Jesus Christ just to support them in their grief. My, my sister was a terrific mom. She absolutely loved her kids, and they will miss her terribly. So it was my place to, uh, to pray for them uh, as they mourn their loss. Praying through our trying times is always, always the best response to the trials and the troubles of life. We all go through them. Some of us more frequently than others, that's true. But when we pray through our trials, it somehow makes the burden lighter. It somehow makes it a little easier. And remember, our prayer changes everything. Amen. Let's, let's pray together. Dearest Jesus, we thank you for your word. We thank you for how you lift us up. We're grateful that God always wins. He's never late. He's never early. Lord God, just, uh, just be with us as we go forward, reminding us to pray during those difficult times. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, for those who are here with us in person, uh, we have our offering plate there at the back of the sanctuary. For those who are joining us uh, from their uh, computer screens, uh, there are other ways that, that you can uh, make sure that we receive the offerings that you have for us. Is we uh, use Venmo, that you can uh, uh, help us uh, you know, contribute to the service that way, or drop it in the mail, or drop it by the church if you're in the area. And as always, we always appreciate the gifts that are so generously shared with us that enable us to do what it is we do. I'd like to pray over the offerings, those that we have received, and those that we are soon to receive. Let's, let's pray together. God, you are the giver of all good gifts. Guide us to open-handed generosity with our time, our talents, and our tithes. Remember that Jesus gave his all for us. Bless these gifts and give us the wisdom to use them to bless others. Amen. I'd like to uh, direct your attention to these things these boxes and cans and jars. This is just a tiny sample of food that has been donated through this church that will go to Community Hope Center. Normally, historically, we have uh, this Sunday, the Sunday before Thanksgiving, is Bounty Sunday, and people bring foods in to share with the hungry. And, uh, but, but we've been doing things differently during COVID. We've been uh, continuous. So, so you'd be surprised how often that room gets filled up with food items to go to the food pantry. But now these items, they're, they're going to make their way to the food pantry. And this, like I said, is just a very small sample of what we have back in that closet. But uh, these items are going to be going to families that are struggling right now. And so... Through these food items, we are going to pray for them. So we're going to pray over these items that they will bless those who receive. Let's pray. Dearest Jesus, we thank you that you have given us enough that we can in turn share your blessings with other people. We lift up all of these food items. We pray for the families who will be receiving them and enjoying them more. We pray that they will sense your love and your grace in every bite, Lord. We pray that they will turn to you knowing that, that you have provided these items for them to fill their tummies, to fill their hearts, to fill their spirits, Lord. We ask that you would bless those families abundantly and uh, speak into their hearts and draw them close to you, Lord. We pray this in Jesus' name.
Now, one of the things that we do every, every week here at Awakening is we have communion, communion meditation. We don't do the traditional litur uh, liturgy. Um, I'm hoping that those who are with us here today have picked up a little communion cup with a little wafer in there. And um, if you're joining us from home, I'm hoping that you participate as well with juice and bread and just whatever you have on hand. If you remember in the Bible story that uh, where Jesus gets uh, arrested and, and taken away, uh, one, of his, one of his disciples by the name of Peter swore he would never turn his back on Jesus, and yet three times that night, he insists that he doesn't know who Jesus is, and Jesus predicted that. By the time the rooster crows, you will have denied me three times. So, when Peter heard the sound of the rooster crowing, probably sent shivers down his spine, and he was like doing one of those, face palm, boom. Jesus was right. I have denied him three times. I mean, shivers went down his spine for the rest of his life. On that fateful night in the temple court, after his third denial, that sound of the rooster crowing became terrifying to him. Peter had denied Jesus three times, and now the rooster was blaring an alarm. But what if Peter chose a different response? What if instead of feeling guilt every time he heard a rooster crow, what if he chose to be reminded, I messed up, but I'm forgiven? What if he chose that instead? See, the message of Jesus isn't one of condemnation. He didn't come to condemn, right? That was not his purpose. He didn't come to condemn, but he came to forgive. So today, as we take the bread and the cup, we're reminded of his body on the cross and his blood poured out for us. Let's not wallow in guilt and remorse. Instead, let's let it be a time of thankfulness and a reminder of the forgiveness that is ours for the asking. Body and blood of Christ is given for each and every one of us. Let us share in this communion. Let's now join in the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Now we turn to our benediction. We have a particular benediction that we do every Sunday. And so you'll find that on the screen back here. Let us, uh, let us share this benediction together. Go out into the world in peace. Have courage. Hold on to what is good. Return no one evil for evil, strengthen the faint-hearted, support the weak, help the suffering, honor all people, because all people are God's people. Love and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. As we prepare to sing our closing song, I invite you to stand and sing along with us.